So you might ask, are there any examples of God using an archaic or outdated word on purpose? Well, yeah. We find that in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Now, I've got pictures of a couple of donkeys there. Uh, it's a story about a guy looking for some donkeys. Now, they're going to call it something else, so you'll excuse me if I read this. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And so, of course, Saul and the servant passed through this place, and they passed through that place, and passed over here and over there. And I'm not going to read all the places to you. But they did not find the donkeys. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, let us return. He wants to go back home, and he's kind of worried. Verse 6, the servant is now talking to him, says, Behold now, there is in the city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. And maybe we can ask him what to do about the, you know, our missing donkeys. Verse 7, Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? He wants to give him a gift, you know, in, in exchange for doing this nice favor by maybe, you know, telling him, giving him advice or, you know, inquiring of God where to go find these donkeys. Verse 8, and the servant answered Saul again, said, Behold, I have here, you know, a little bit of money to pay him. Now, verse 9 is the important one. Verse 9 is in parentheses, okay? Now, are there parentheses in the originals? No, but... They recognized early on, this is a side note from God, okay? God is getting ready to explain something to us, and it's like he, he puts this in the middle of a, of a narrative. It's a note to us. I'm going to write this out, otherwise you guys might miss it, okay? So let me explain what I'm about to do, okay? It's really great of him to do that. So here's the note to us. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spoke. Spake, come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Now, seer equals prophet. God didn't even have to bother telling us that. By the time the book of First Samuel gets written, the word seer had fallen out of use. Nobody's going around saying seer anymore. If he wanted to, he could have used the word prophet, and no one would have noticed. Yet God chose to quote the servant of Saul instead of giving us an updated edition or modern translation of what the servant said. For whatever reason, God thought it was important to quote the servant of Saul verbatim. Either that, or God really likes to use this old word seer. Now, I don't understand why. Once again, when it happened, when Saul and his servant were out looking for the donkeys, that word was in use. But by the time it gets recorded for us in the book of 1 Samuel, it's no longer in use. No one would have probably noticed had God just translated it, prophet, and let's just move on and not bore everybody with some trivia detail. But that's not what happens. So they go on in verse 11, he's going to use the word seer. And they're going to use that word seer in a lot of places. Now, let's skip ahead. Years later, in First Chronicles 29, now the Acts of David the King, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, and in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the book of Gad, the seer. By this time, and this is probably a few hundred years later, they're using the word seer and prophet interchangeably. What happened? God introduced a word. He brought a word back into practice or vogue. And now it's part of their vocabulary. See, when God comes down to our level, you got to realize he's got a very large vocabulary. 
He can't use it all with us. We don't know his vocabulary. So he's going to kind of lower what he says to us to get it kind of onto our level. Uh, but wouldn't it be great if every now and then he could teach us something and have us rise up and start using a, a higher vocabulary like he does? And if, uh, now, this is, not, this is not the only occasion where this is used. Years later after that, in the book of Amos, we find it. Seer. He introduced an old word, and it became used. So he dusted off an old word and used it, and it became part of the language from then on. Now people use this word. It was an old and forgotten one. So when your pastor comes across an archaic word that he reads in the Bible, and he can feel free to give the congregation a definition of that word. But we need to leave it in the text. Okay, it may come back into vogue later on. You don't just scratch out a word going, well, we don't use this one anymore. No, you go ahead and make a little note off to the side. This is what that word means. And then congratulations, you've added a word to your vocabulary. It's a good thing, not a bad thing. But if you're saying, you know, I still feel that I'm going to need some help with that text. I've been so used to reading these other versions. Well... I think the biggest problem you're going to have with the uh, the old King James is the names of these guys, okay? They laugh at our names, like Chuck and Donald. They think, well, that's, you know, ridiculous. To us, those are normal names. When you get some of these guys like Sherebeth and stuff like that, well, we're not used to saying names like that, so it seems kind of funny. But if you still need some help, I do have a small recommendation for you. You don't have to do it, I, but I have discovered that there is something out there called the Defined King James Bible, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a sample page. Um, notice some of the words are in bold print, uh, and they have a number above them. Well, let's select one here on the left here, Publicans, and you'll notice that it has a number five. So you go down to the bottom of the footnotes. It says... Tax collectors for the Roman Empire. Now, they didn't scratch out the word publican. They didn't insert the definition into the text, pretending that it's part of the Word of God. They just defined it at the bottom. They've left the text alone. The text is important. Okay? So, if you know, some of these words I don't think you really need help with, uh, justified the word somewhat. I think a lot of these are pretty easy to figure out. and Of course, I'm used to reading it. So, But if you if you think a good definition like this at the bottom would help you, well then, feel free to get you one of these. Uh, here's their address, thebiblefortoday.org, and I won't spend many more time on that commercial. But uh, I want to encourage you, read your old Bible. It's good. In my opinion, it's still the best. Uh, that's all.